I'm Shahar Azani and welcome to this JBS special featuring the rising wave of anti-Semitism on college campuses and more importantly what is and can be done about it. An initiation ceremony at the University of South Florida a few months ago featured drawing a swastika on the head of a Jewish pledge. CUNY Law School invites Nadine Kiswani, a notorious anti-Israel activist and head of Students for Justice in Palestine, to give a commencement speech at the school while faculty supports an anti-Israel BDS resolution of the student government. From tearing mezuzahs in the dorms to drawing swastikas at the entrances to Hillel, the problem just seems to be getting worse and worse. The reality today is that too many Jewish students feel unsafe in what has become, in some places, a hostile and uninviting, to say the least, environment. What's being done to stand up against these phenomena on college campuses? Well, the Academic Engagement Network, AEN, was founded in 2015 as a national organization of faculty members and staff on American university and college campuses, which seeks to oppose efforts to delegitimize Israel, support education about Israel in the academia, and to counter anti-Semitism wherever and whenever it rears its ugly head on campus. Our esteemed guest today is the AEN's Executive Director, Miriam Elman. Miriam assumed her role as AEN's Executive Director on May 15, 2019. She brings to AEN a wealth of knowledge and experience, engaging as a thought leader on the pernicious impacts of the BDS movement and other forms of hostility to Israel and the Jewish people on college campuses and within academia. Miriam has written about issues such as the stealth boycott of Israeli scholars, looking forward to hear about that, the relationship between on and off campus BDS organizations and the growing influence of groups such as Jewish Voice for Peace and If Not Now. She frequently speaks about these issues to a wide variety of media and community organizations and has published numerous articles and reports in many publications. She is currently on leave from her appointment as Associate Professor of Political Science at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University and is the editor and co-editor of six books and author of over 65 journal articles, book chapters and government reports on topics related to international and national security, religion, politics, the Middle East and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Wow, Miriam, I'm so excited having you on JBS today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for that kind introduction. Oh, you know, the introduction itself teaches and says a lot about what you do. So allow me to start with that introduction and ask you, before we dive into the nitty gritty of the details and the organization and the activities, say a few words for the sake of our viewers of what is the stealth boycott. Sure. So, you know, we usually hear about uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions resolutions coming out of student government, or we hear about various artists, musicians who are boycotted by the BDS movement, um, but we don't hear about all the boycotting that's happening behind the scenes that doesn't get covered in YouTube or that doesn't have a paper trail. Um, and we think, you know, in our organization um, that uh, that boycotting is very pernicious, it's widespread, um, and sometimes we hear about it more formally. Uh, for example, when hundreds of faculty across American universities pledge not to write letters of reference for their undergraduate students who wanted to do study abroad in Israel. And then we realized that's been happening for years, but nobody had mentioned it. They were just doing that behind the scenes, sort of it's stealthily, right? Um, and, and, and we don't know, for example, how many Israeli faculty are not invited in the first place onto campus. We hear about the disruptions of events, but what about all the uh, uh, faculty and experts from Israel who are never invited in the first place because uh, BDS faculty don't want them there or other faculty don't want the headache. And that's what we mean by the stealth boycott. 
Wow. Um, you know, at the end of the day, that also sheds a light on the importance of Israel education that we mentioned. The fact that you're not waiting for the disruptions or the problems, you engage proactively in providing proper and objective education when it comes to Israel and the situation in the region. That's right. That's right. And so at AEN Academic Engagement Network, we have a microgrants program, a speaker bureau program. We have a small boutique publishing house at AAN. We post a lot of that material on our website for the general public as well. Uh, but our goal is really to make sure that there are uh, quality peer review journal articles, university press books that can make it onto syllabi on campuses, that there are events, programs, educational programs that our faculty members can host and sponsor that can be counter speech, that's bringing better speech to the bad speech uh, that students are hearing and, and, and are being exposed to right. on their campuses. So, so let's talk for a minute about what's happening on the ground. Um, do you see, we're seeing the uh, detractors of Israel and many of the anti-Semitic movements and organizations are becoming more and more brazen in their activities on campus. We spoke about tearing down the mezuzahs. We talked about, you know, throwing rocks at the uh, celebration of uh, Pesach Seder on the rooftop of a Hillel building. We saw other incidents. What are you seeing as, um, as the trend? Is it really getting worse as far as these incidents on college campuses? What are you seeing on the ground during the years that you're at the helm of the AEN? Right. So, you know, there still is the demonization of Israel, the delegitimization of Israel, the factually inaccurate resolutions, and, and all that is still happening. But what we're seeing, and we're seeing this on campuses where a majority of Jewish uh, students, young people are matriculating. Um, so in about 200 to 300 campuses are the ones that we are tracking. That's where you have large student Jewish populations. Um, and that's where you also find Student for Justice in Palestine and other uh, organizations that are virulently anti-Israel. We're finding that the situation is no longer just hostility towards Israel. It's also hostility towards Zionism, a key component of Jewish identity for most Jewish students and faculty and staff on campuses. Um, we're also finding that there is targeted attack of Jewish student life on campus. So attacks on Hillel, which you mentioned in your intro, um, vandalism of Hillel and Chabad on campus as well. Um, which we didn't see 10 years ago. You know, we just didn't see that kind of um, targeting of, of Jewish life on campus, the targeting of Jewish identity. What we're also seeing, Shahar, is that there are students who are reporting to us and reporting to our faculty and are, you know, showing it in survey data um, that they are increasingly being ostracized from campus activism on account of their Zionism, on account of their attachment to Israel, even having gone to Israel on a birthright trip, might get them disqualified from student government, might make them persona non grata at um, progressive type um, uh, activities uh, that have nothing to do with Israel. Let's say fossil fuel divestment or prison reform in America or Black Lives Matter. Uh, women's rights, LGBTQ rights. These are issues that Jewish students want to be part of. They're part of the American conversation. And on campuses, they're being told you can only participate if you disavow your Zionism first, if you sign up for BDS first, then you can participate. So what we're seeing on campus is this division between the good Jew and the bad Jew. The good Jew being the Jew that is anti-Zionist, that's part of Jewish Voice for Peace, or if not now, um, that's very hostile towards Israel and hostile towards Zionism. Uh, and then the bad Jew that is a Zionist, but may be progressive, but is still a bad Jew uh, on account of their Zionism.
You know, the, um, the, that, that line between you know, anti-Israel and anti-Semitism, blatant, naked, unadulterated anti-Semitism, uh, is crossed all too often. And you mentioned in one of your recent reports a tour organized for Palestinian inciter Mohammed al-Kurd, who visited various campuses around the U.S. and talked about Zionists who drink the blood of Palestinians, which is truly um, the, the Bayless blood libel. This is 101. There is no way around it. And I want to ask you, Miriam, so eloquently you describe the issues. You seem to have a, a very clear spotlight onto what's happening on the ground. Tell us a little bit about the AEN's work to counter those nefarious attempts. What do you do on the ground to empower Jewish students, but also to counter all of the bad stuff that's happening? It's a great question and it's key to our work. Um, and first of all, when something like that happens, a speaker comes onto campus and um, crosses the line clearly. This is not criticism of Israel that is totally acceptable and is part and parcel of what happens in Israel, right? Lots of criticism, lots of critique. It's a robust democracy with a free press um, and that's all fine. But what, what we're seeing is actually the use of anti-Semitic tropes and canards about the Jew in discussions of Israel, in discussions of the conflict. And that is simply unacceptable. So the first thing we wanna make sure is that that gets exposed. Um, many times these events are not filmed uh, you don't know this speech happened. Uh, we want to make sure that our faculty are at the events so that they can report about it, so that they can expose it to who? Uh, not only to the larger Jewish community, but also to campus administrators, because we want university leaders to do their job. And in the same way that they would respond forcefully and unequivocally when any other community was harassed or demoralized or demeaned or denigrated, we want the university leaders to speak up for Jewish students as well in the same way um, so that there aren't any double standards. And our faculty members really hold university leaders to the, you know, put their feet to the fire, say, you have to do this. You cannot be silent and allow that, that kind of ugly, hateful and hurtful speech to stand. Um, so it's partly getting the university to do their job in, in acknowledging hate speech against um, Jewish students and faculty and staff, and then uh, putting in an action plan. So it's not enough just to release a statement and then wait for the next incident and release a statement. There needs to be an action plan in place. Um, and there needs to be training of the administration as well as training of student leaders, um, you know, everything from residential life to student government. And it's a process that can take somewhere between one to two years. It's not, you know, it's not an easy fix. It's a long-term commitment to really change the campus climate for Jewish Zionist and Israeli students. Um, and uh, we produce um, a materials. Well, so before, that, before the production of yeah. materials, I just want to ask you from your vast experience in academia, yeah. how do you explain the fact that when there is injustice perpetrated against other groups, there is an immediate instinct of justice within university administrations, and yet when there is blatant anti-Semitism, the way you describe, it takes you to go there and put their feet to the fire and get them to do something. It really be be bewilders me to think about the gap between the same individual and such a different response. You know, we don't have a problem when there's a swastika that comes onto the campus. Typically, a swastika or far-right leaflet leafleting, which is actually happening, some of the flyover country campuses uh, where um, it, you know, in Indiana, Utah, Colorado, you will get targeting and there's the swastika. And, and typically the administration responds well. Um, they'll release a statement. This is abhorrent. We don't. So they, they recognize that anti-Semitism. What they don't recognize is Israel related anti-Semitism. They, they don't understand it. They think it's just politics. Then they rely on campus free expression or the Zionist drinking the blood of, of Palestinians Zionist, Zionist drinking the blood of Palestinians you know that was that was a this that that appeared as a cartoon 
uh, um, that Jewish Voice for Peace put out recently on social media. Right. Um, they don't understand how to deal with social media. Right. Th this all requires training. Um, and it requires understanding of what your responsibilities and obligations are, um, including under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. So there's a lot of training that has to happen. Um, by and large, the administrators we've met um, oh, and we've met hundreds and interacted with hundreds and trained hundreds, um, they're largely well-meaning. They are not involved in anti-Israel activism. They are not like Mohammed al kurd They may have been uh, you know, coming from disciplines and departments where they've been exposed to a lot of Israel hostility, but they're not in their positions in order to denigrate, demean uh, Jewish students. Correct. Uh, but what they don't know is they don't understand and, 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 and they don't have a good understanding of Jewish experience, Jewish identity, and the ways in which hostility towards Israel crosses the line into anti-Semitism. Once they understand it, once they're trained in it, they can see it better and they can respond. And we're actually seeing that, that administrators who get our training and receive our training are responding much better in a more timely fashion, in a way that Jewish students are appreciating. Actually, that's an excellent point that you're making, because when we look at the general public and we think about educating Israel, about Israel and the geopolitics, there is a tendency to chase the red meat and to only follow the bad guys and to think we can change their minds and sing with them, have an agila around the picture of Golda Meir. But the truth is that the huge majority has no idea. And ignorance is the great breeding ground for such incidents. So the, to be able to change the situation, you're actually targeting these academicians and you're offering them education, tools, capacity building and training in order to be able to cope. That includes, I imagine, a better understanding also of the geopolitics. So that when somebody makes an atrocious statement like so-and-so drink such-and-such of so-and-so, they are able to analyze it and understand how ridiculous that statement is. Now, I do see in the corner of my eye a book lying on the table, and you're mentioning materials, so maybe you can share it with our viewers and tell us a little bit, what is this, who, who is this provided, how can they put their hands on it, and uh, how is this representative of your overall educational effort? Yes, so... If you go on our website, we have pamphlets. And the website is? The website is? If you can repeat it, just uh, say it for the viewers. It's um, academicengagement.org. Mm -hmm. So it's very easily found also through just Googling Academic Engagement Network. Mm -hmm. um, and we have on our website under resources, we have so much material. Um, we have webinars, we have pamphlets, we have um, uh, statements and op-eds and a host of information. What we did recently, and this was actually a two-year project, is we produced a 300-page guide and resource book that, that I'm holding, which um, has narrative chapters, 13 chapters, that walk readers through what is the situation on campus and how has the anti-Israel movement coarsened the climate and how has it negatively impacted academic principles such as campus free expression and academic freedom. Um, and so that's half of this book. And the other half is modeling appropriate responses. Everything from religious accommodation uh, to how to handle disruptive speakers to how to address the divisiveness of the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement um, and we have models of faculty statements, of administrator statements, so that university leaders and faculty can see that this has been done elsewhere and has had a positive impact. So we have this guidebook online. It's available to download for free. And who is it for? Who is your target audience? This is, Anyone? This is, I mean, it says, you know, a guide for faculty and university leaders. So it's primarily geared for faculty members who you know, don't know the issues, but think there's a problem on the campus and want to help. And most of our members in AEN, we have about 850 faculty members. Oh, wow. um, they are not experts in Israel studies or in Jewish studies or in you know, anti-Semitism. So they need to read this in order to have the wherewithal to respond appropriately in the academic senate to their colleagues, to provosts, and, and help them mentor their students. So it's primarily for them, but it's also for 
the whole mid-level strata of university administration, deans of students, provosts, vice presidents, um, equity officials, diversity officials, right, who are really getting some hands-on modeling of what they can do. And we have heard from administrators, we've, we've sent this out hard copy hun to hundreds of administrators. And they have told us they were now getting, you know, they said, we, we, took, we took a few days and we read this. And we now have the models that we can use when there's an incident that happens on our campus. Amazing. We're going to turn to page 232 and literally use that statement from UMass um, you know, Boston as an example, right? So we have examples from private and public, small and large universities so that um, our faculty and administrators can really um, uh, have good models to use when, when Miriam, incidents happen. Miriam, le let's take a practical uh, taste, right, for our viewers. So you mentioned, for instance, disruptive speakers. Uh, so in the second half of the book, what do you do when there is a disruptive speaker like Mohammed al Kurd, for instance, or others? What, what's your recommendation? Right. So first of all, um, uh, disrupting speech is not protected. Um, and it, it's a violation of the student code of conduct. It's a violation of university rules, of public universities. It's a violation of the First Amendment, right? You can protest peacefully. You can do a peaceful picket outside of the hall or the event room. You cannot um, hijack the event, take it over and make it your own, which often happens when there are Israeli speakers or right. even Jewish themed speakers, Correct. but that BDS groups don't like. And so they want to um, disrupt it in such a way that it becomes their event, right? They kind of try to take it right. over. Right. Um, they, they sometimes do disrupt and that is not acceptable. So we have guidelines in here of what university leaders and faculty who might host events, uh, what they can distribute, what they can say at the start of an event, um, and what to do if a disruption does happen. Um, and, and, you know, that, that, that the university needs to make it clear to the campus community, this will not be tolerated. Right. And we are going to support viewpoint diversity and free expression on this campus, and we're not going to tolerate that. It also requires a conscious effort for viewpoint diversity. On way too many campuses, there is simply not enough viewpoint diversity when it comes to Israel, when it comes to Zionism, when it comes to the conflict. Right. And so um, certain concentrated interest groups uh, are monopolizing the discourse. They're right. monopolizing the conversation. And it's up to the university administration to make sure that students are exposed to a wide variety of opinions and viewpoints, particularly if they're taking federal money for a Middle Eastern studies program. It is simply not compliant with the federal mandate um, of Title VI to allow for one biased event after another and not to have something that is counter speech that challenges that. Um, so that's that's on the university to do that. You're also mentioning how important it is not to use the official channels of the university to hijack the agenda and how to really show a diversity of views, whether they're comfortable or uncomfortable, and do more. That's what resonated with me the most. More than just words, we need to see deeds. More than just statements, we need to see enforcement. We don't have much time left, unfortunately. So I want to ask you quickly. You are working um, on promoting study abroad in Israel and making sure to remove barriers as an important tool of interaction between academic institutions. And then you also focus your message not just on students where you have various organizations working with students, you're working with faculty members. So give us an example quickly of one success story that you had with a faculty member who interacted with AEN or visited Israel. Inspire us, Miriam. We have so many. Give us, actually. please. Um, I'm sure. And it's so sometimes hard to choose, but I'll tell you that, you know, one thing that we are finding is, and you mentioned it, the use of official channels. Um, faculty have the academic freedom to sign whatever piece of garbage they want to sign. They want to sign an anti Israel resolution, as happened, you know, last spring when so many virently anti-Israel, one-sided, biased, factually inaccurate, inflammatory statements were released. And faculty, hundreds were signing these things, not maybe not even reading them. 
Um, they want to sign it, sign it. But when an academic department issues a mission statement, which bakes anti-Zionism and hostility towards Israel into the mission statement of the department, that is not something that can be tolerated, right? That is exclusionary to Jewish students. Right. How can Jewish students feel respected, right. right? Now, it's not a student issue, right? It's a faculty issue. And we have had success in having our faculty members raise these concerns with their units, with um, the university administration. Uh, and in a number of cases, there is now a rethinking of department statements, not only about Israel or about the conflict, but in general. So we are having an impact on the academy writ large so that we have a more healthy campus for everybody in academia. And I think that's huge. Um, we're bringing more faculty and uh, administrators to Israel. We're interested in exchange where the academic engagement network we want faculty to engage with each other were very critical of boycott. And on many of our campuses and many of our um, uh, campaigns, we have brought the faculty voice to weigh in on how academic boycotts of Israel's academy is antithetical to everything that the academy stands for. We can simply not tolerate having academic boycotts of Israel. It shortchanges American students. Forget what it does to Israeli faculty and Israeli graduate students, both Arab and Jewish. Um, it, it harms them, but it harms American students right. who are deprived of educational opportunities. So we are at the forefront of that battle and we are having one success after another. Miriam, I can't tell you how happy I am to have had this uh, quick conversation with you. I feel we could go on for hours, and I love the main message you end with, which is exactly contradictory to the core of the BDS movement. The BDS tries to sever connections between Israel and the world, and you, Miriam, and the AEN are saying, making these connections uh, viable is not just important between Israel and the world, but it's a principle of the academic world to encourage academic engagement. So thank you so much for joining us on JBS today, Miriam, and for your incredible perspective and support for Israel and the Jewish people, and in general, for academia. It's been really enlightening listening to you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. <laughs> really appreciate it. I think most important of all is for all of us to understand that we can all make a difference if only we choose to. So academicengagement.org is an incredibly important avenue and I encourage all of you to look up the tutorial and to look not just for statements and words and descriptions of problems and bemoaning on the couch, but also for solutions. I'd like to thank all of you, our viewers, for watching this JBS special. I'm Shahar Azani. Until next time, Shalom and Lehitraot. See you all soon. Please to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.